So when I was released from the hospital and on medication, I mean, I, I didn't want anybody to know. Um, because it's, it's some sort of... It's, to me, it's like one of the worst things that could happen to a person is to be told that their brain is broken in that fragile state of being freshly diagnosed, starting these new, you know, psychological medications and therapies. It's a very delicate place. And it could, it did kind of, um, and still a little more fear in me towards um, being open about who I am and accepting myself. It's not something that's talked about or discussed. Really. It's just like, uh, here's this secret you get to keep, sort of thing. I miss you. All through high school, I was really ashamed. Even when I first started noticing uh, as a 10-year-old, I you don't want to tell your friends, I don't know why, but I don't want to play with you. And then when you get to junior high, you're trying to hide that you're cutting yourself. You know that's not normal and you don't want people to know. And then all through high school, I continued to struggle with that. I didn't want people to think I was weird. I didn't want to get made fun of, so I kept it inside when I should have been talking to someone about it. Even in college, when I got there, uh, starting new relationships with the people there. If you've never met someone dealing with a mental illness, or you've never dealt with one yourself, sometimes it's very hard to understand. And I met a lot of people who couldn't quite understand what I was going through. Um, I really only first noticed it when I when I moved here to Aberdeen. I don't remember when exactly was it, but like everything suddenly hit me. Like the reason why I was hated, somewhat tortured emotionally, and why I got so mad like it was very very hard for me to make friends because of it like I'm not saying that I'm not saying that this is a bad town and all it's it's pretty cool here and everything um it's just that people didn't really accept me right away and um they, they actually really discriminated me which means like um Thinking that you're an outcast, you don't belong here. I was so nervous for it that, you know, somebody would think differently of me. And I don't want people to think differently of me. I don't want people to think differently of me because I have it. And I don't want people to treat me differently because I have it. I don't want it to be an excuse, like, you know, oh, I'm having a bad day, oh, he's got bipolar disorder, you know, whatever. I don't want it to be an excuse like that. I want it to just, you know, be matters fa matter of fact, I have bipolar disorder, and then, you know, kind of let's get over it, kind of do. I miss you. survivor, I guess you could say, of mental health stigma. Uh, things started to slowly decline for me uh, in, when I was 20. I tried to um, commit suicide, uh, went into the uh, mental institution, um, was involuntarily committed, and slowly my, my family started to kind of um, talk about it. My name is Jill Furin, and when I was 10 years old, I started to notice that something was wrong. 
I didn't quite know what that was, but I stopped wanting to go out to play with my friends at recess and I'd rather stay inside with the guidance counselor or a teacher who needed help. And this feeling of not wanting to be around anyone continued until I was about 13 years old. It had gotten so bad that I, I didn't know what to do and I'd actually started cutting myself. Now at age 13, I made the decision to take my life. I was very unsuccessful in that attempt and I'm grateful for that now. Even though all through my teenage years, all through college and still today, I'm struggling with a severe depressive disorder. My name is D'Artagnan Schmidt, even though I was rather be called Dart. I am in eighth grade, going into ninth grade here pretty soon. My form of autism here, which is a PDD NOS, uh, forgot what it stands for. It's um, basically it's just an emotional type of autism where you could get sad very fast and easily, mad very fast and easily, or any other emotions very fast and easily, which is kind of torturous in a way, having to live with that and try to keep it in control. Yeah, it started to become unbearable in my head where I was thinking about committing suicide. But I, I didn't tell anyone because I was afraid. I'm, uh, I'm Max Chamberlain um, and I have bipolar disorder. I, I first noticed I was depressed at about eight. And then I started to think, well, maybe it's just in the winter, because in the winter I, I'm depressed, and then during the summer I'm great, and then it would do that for a couple years. And then it started switching, where I'd be depressed in the summer and happy in the winter, and then that confused me. And then it started getting to the point where it was just like, I didn't even know what season what would be. You know, it could be fall and I'm depressed, and then two weeks later I'd be, you know, I'd be happy again, just on a mania. And uh, that year, 2012, I, uh, I had a lot of uh, suicidal thoughts that came up. And I should probably mention that I've had suicidal thoughts since I was maybe 13. And uh, I just kept it all to myself, really. And the thing that um, bothered me, which is what did not help my situation, is um, it was not something that my family openly talked to with me. It was more something that uh, was discussed between them behind closed doors. Also kind of feeling guilt that even though my family and people around me kind of, it's almost like they kind of feared me, but they also cared for me and they just didn't know what to do. Um, so I just really kept quiet about it because I kind of I knew if I were to be open about this and and look for support, I didn't really think I was going to get it, if I was open and honest. When I was 13, I finally went to a doctor, and going there, having to see a doctor because you're sad and not quite realizing that it's more than just being sad, it's something that you do feel shameful for. I know it's also something my parents struggled with. What did we do wrong that we need to bring our child to a doctor so that she can be happy and live a normal life? So that was something that was difficult. It was obviously something that I didn't share with people around me. You would say that I became a little bit too, um, like, concealing of my emotions. In seventh grade, I was just a loner, so to say, like, you don't want to be part of a group or be with people or anything. Practically have no friends at all. Somehow we get onto the subject of uh, mood disorders or uh, depression, or we we'd somehow get onto that subject, and I'd be like, you know, I have I have bipolar disorder, and people would be like, really, you do? And I'm like, yeah. And like, I wouldn't suspect you to have bipolar disorder. You're just you know, you're happy-go-lucky all the time. 
um, and you're really relaxed. And I was like, you know, yeah, you know, there's a there's a stigma with bipolar, um, but uh, they would, you know, I'm, I'm still the same Max. You've known me for this long, and you've gotten along with me for this long, and now you just know I have bipolar. Even though I was hiding my cutting as an adolescent, people knew, my peers knew. And a lot of them, uh, instead of talking to me about it or talking to an adult about it that could have gotten me help, uh, instead they talked to each other about it. And I did get made fun of for that. And then there was one friend that I had who finally said, I see what you're doing. Why are you doing this to yourself? And I couldn't explain to her, but I could tell her that I knew I needed help and uh, she got me to talk to my parents, and that's finally how I got help. Counseling has helped me by, um, with everything, social, um, social groups, um, a way to take my anger out in a positive way, and really just be able to help me relax. It may sound kind of cheesy when I say this, but it's opened my eyes. And I finally realized that my depression was getting in the way of, you know, everything I enjoy in life. And I decided it was time to go in for help again. It was like an hour session and then a couple more sessions. And then he was like, you know, um, you have bipolar disorder. He told me that I am going to be taking mood stabilizers. And I have to say, my life is so much better with uh, mood stabilizers. I was afraid that that there would be, I would turn into a zombie. But overall, my life is a lot better now that I'm taking mood stabilizers. I was at a show and I randomly started talking to this woman and we started talking about mental health. And we, of course, just kind of, you know, we shared our stories and we ranted a little bit and it was like, wow. It felt so good to just talk with this one person who has been through not the exact same thing I've been through, but knows what it's like. She and I became close friends and I got involved with this organization called South Dakota United for Hope and Recovery. I was allowed to just listen and hear other people talk about their their stories and their challenges that they've overcome. It was really empowering to know that I was not alone and it's okay to talk about it. Like, that's one of the biggest things that has helped me accept myself as a person. And that is one of the biggest things why I'm not afraid to talk about what I've been through, or what I'm like, or help other people understand or talk. Just by little things like talking in a group of friends or like posting what I'm working on overcoming on Facebook too. Like here in eighth grade, I've got four or six good friends, but like, you only need one good friend to be able to get through things. Another turning point was in college when I decided I no longer have to be ashamed about this. And instead, why don't I use my experience and why don't I use my life expertise in having a mental illness to help others with mental illness? And uh, let others know that no matter what you're going through, you can live a normal life. And I think that we can change this perception. There are plenty of, you know, successful people in the world who, who have a um, mental health history, who have overcome. Once you realize, hey, this is something that my friends, my family, my coworkers, uh, people around me are living with and I didn't even know, um, Accepting that and realizing that it's it's not something to be afraid of. We've never been afraid of it um, without knowing. So once we do know that someone has a mental illness or we ourselves have a mental illness, we shouldn't be scared of it any longer. Look around, like, who knows? Like, 
all your friends could have disabilities, but they're also afraid to tell. What if you have disabilities? What if your friends have it? What if pretty much half the neighborhood has it? So I, I think it would really help to know that there are everyday people that that are in your lives that have a mood disorder of some sort and you don't even know it because we can act like normal human beings. We don't freak out on people all the time. But I can't be done just yet I've done nothing I regret Never feel Yeah, it really comes down to you and me as individuals talking it makes the world of a difference. As I look at my generation and the younger generations, we're so much more accepting of uh, people who are different than ourselves. And I think that that's just going to get better and better. Uh, that the generation after mine is gonna be even more accepting of people who are different than themselves and say, hey, I'm not going through what you're going through, but that's all right, and we can still uh, work together and be friends. Yeah.